Hi, I'm Heinbach. Good to have you back. This is the first Patreon Q&A, where I answer questions that are sent to me by everybody who supports what I do on Patreon. If you want to get some questions in, just subscribe to any tier in my Patreon, and I'll be doing this monthly or at least bi-monthly from now on. So, let's get it started. Chris Kostelek has two questions, the first of which, are there types of test equipment that you've tried, but have generally found to be worthless for musical purposes? Not that many. There is some medical stuff that's hard to use because you need some kind of flash interface to get the current running. But even that, I ended my landfill totem performance with this, uh, yeah, basically electric shocker by pulling the cable out of that and then it would go beep by itself. And that was basically uh, a nice finish to the whole performance. So even that I could use musical. Or a plant stimulator that I get, which is just this tiny box when it puts out pulses and you can use the pulses to ping something and then you've got basically a fixed rate pulse generator. Still useful. There is some stuff that's like meant for um, ham radio that only works in the megahertz range. And that is something that I couldn't get to work. I couldn't adapt to the correct frequencies or, or even find the correct adapters to the whole thing. And uh, yeah, so some stuff that's for radio, I couldn't really use. So that's something to check for if it goes into kilo cycles and is not just into megahertz. Chris Kostelek, second question. How do you find your equipment? Do you email school departments to see if they have older equipment lying around? That's what Sam Lookman of Computer does. I actually just... A lot of stuff is from eBay Classifieds, which is like eBay, but just no bidding, very direct human-to-human -human interactions. And I got a lot of my brilliant care from one guy who just puts up the stuff from his dead grandfather's garage from time to time. So I go there, uh, I go to like the place where he works. He has some brilliant care in his, drunk, uh, in his tr trunk and uh, I get that uh, and either lug it to the train or get an Uber and drive it home. And yeah, so that's very local and direct. Else, um, yeah, it's basically eBay or it's starting to people offering me stuff directly, which I find amazing because some of the more rare pieces, uh, yeah, I found that way. Mm. Brent Heatherwick asks, I'd like you to hear to get into specifics about sound degradation techniques. Oof, that's more like a video on its own because that's a very broad question and I would have to think deeply about what that could even be about. Um, I mean, when we're talking about tape loops, I found mechanical destruction to be the most reliable way to achieve what I'm looking for because I don't want to damage the machines. So acid and all that stuff is out of the question. And magnets, yeah, well, it just either it didn't work because I didn't have strong enough magnets or the degradation was just immediate. So it just gone. And that's not a interesting process. So the actual scraping away of tape does sound interesting or just wobbling the tape when it gets garbled up and you get these whir, 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 whir. that's especially interesting with cassette when you switch the two sides so you hear uh, you're mixing both sides that can be really interesting Henrik Wieberg do you have any advice on what's the best starting point for someone with no modular about to try the Seattle Lombarda path is that even an option worth considering I think it's absolutely worth considering. See at Lombard, it hides all the technical stuff of modulars under a very playful interface. So if you go that route, you'll probably end up not knowing what you're doing, but you'll get musical results. So I absolutely encourage everybody to go for See at Lombard. And uh, yeah, it's a really beautiful world, especially if you're looking to make music. And are not that technically minded. Um, that said, it does benefit from technical knowledge, but you can just go by your gut, I, I think. Have you 
used to try the Lyra 8 or the Folktech Mescaline. Any thoughts on these instruments? Yes, I've played the Lyra 8. Just sounds gorgeous. Beautiful instrument, almost as everything that Vlad does. He is a true, true pioneer in that he's both an artist and an engineer, and he managed to combine that in a very high quality way. And I'm, I'm very excited for everything he puts out. And the mescaline, I just, I was so close, so close to buying it. This, this close. And uh, I didn't, because it has these tiny mini cables, and I just can't work with them. They are horrible. So I would love, I love the sounds, I love the look, but I can't work with these cables. Project Null. How did you get into music as a living and not just a hobby? Do you come from a musical family or find your own path by yourself? I, when I was 15, I was the first time on stage with my then band, which was just people from the school I was at. And I stood on stage and I completely, I completely lost it. I was so happy being on stage, playing uh, the music that we'd written. And I decided from that moment on when I was 15 that I was gonna make music and nothing else. And I've basically reset my whole life to make music. And I tried every possible way to make more music. Basically, it's m make music to make more music. So it wasn't being that choosy about what kind of music I did. I just wanted to do music and then <laughs> get paid so I could make more music and more and more and more. And after a few years, I mean, it took me to make it into a job from 15 to, I think it took me into a job that would sustain myself. It took 15 years, I think. When I was 30, I was making enough money from my theater scoring, which was one of the make music to make more music things I had discovered, that I yeah, could sustain myself and that became a job. But maybe that's also a good idea for a video to go more in depth on that topic. But basically, I had to focus my whole life on making music and not think about anything else. Don't have, I don't have any other hobbies. It was just music. Um, about your piano style of playing, that's still Project Null. How do you choose the chords? And how do you think the voicings of the chords when you're playing and composing? I actually try not playing at all. Um, I try not to think about muscle memory. And I visualize the chords before. I visualize in my head what I'm going to play. And then I just play that. And oftentimes I cut like... Uh, chords out. So I might record 12 chords over a track and then I cut out three or uh, more because I love blank spaces. I think time and space is, uh, leaving spaces is one of the most underrated uh, things in music. And um, so I don't want to fill it up with my piano playing. In regards to how I uh, think about voicings, it has become an intuitive process for me. I don't think too much about it. I feel when I listen to a piece, I just know what belongs there. It might be a frustrating answer, but that's right now where I'm at with my piano playing, which is actually not that great because I can't take, uh, can't sheet read uh, fast. I can sheet read, but it takes a bit of time for me. And I'm not good at doing fast runs. My hands are simply too slow because I don't have any training for that. I just do these chords, little melodies, and uh, yeah. So I don't consider myself a good piano player. I'm actually more of a composer in that regard. Troy Alden. I don't know if you have this problem, but I tend to start lots of bits and pieces of songs or composition and never get back around to finishing them. I'm wondering if you have any techniques or strategies for finishing things or gathering lots of disparate parts and making something from them. I feel that's a thing that's happened very easily with digital and that I had huge folders with unfinished stuff that I just started and then abandoned. Ever since going mostly analog, I don't have that. Um, something about digital recording and the DAW encourages endless tinkering and you can get lost with um, something like the test equipment or a modular 
or even just a simple dictaphone and a mixer or something, you can get to a point where you're saying this is done much more easily. So going analog basically has solved that problem for me. And I tend to work for two or three days sometimes on a piece, but it just gets finished much more quickly and easily. And uh, yeah, so that was my way around that. I What else I would do if there's unfinished pieces, just put them on a tape loop and combine them with another thing, combine them with another thing, make it all on tape loops, play them together and mess it up through reverb and delays and you'll have a new piece basically. You've remixed yourself without looking at that screen. Um, possible Patri uh, Georges Dau, I hope I pronounced that right, possible Patreon meeting in Berlin between the 21st of December and the 1st of January or in Paris anytime. I do like making uh, Patreon meetups. Um, I'll have to check my schedule if that is something that would work. But yeah, everywhere I go, I try to now organize a Patreon meetup if possible and if the time permits. So yeah, that would be a cool idea. I'll think about that. Black Sand. When and how do you start in music productions? Oh, yeah, I think, yeah, when I, with a band. Basically, I played keyboards in this band and quickly wanted to do more because it became addictive. So I took all the stuff that I could find. I took a radio and went to the whole, to the far left of the dial where you had all these different um, sounds and of M noises and voices coming in and out and put that on the left side of the tape recorder, cassette recorder. On the right side, I played... Uh, a piano, like a digital piano that I played in the band. And uh, then I think that piano even had an in. So I would run uh, the second cheap entertainer keyboard from Yamaha through that and basically play a chord on the Yamaha, play the piano on top and maybe use the internal sequencer on the piano because it's like a you could record like i don't know 250 notes in there and then it would play those and turn the dials on the radio and do a one take recording of that it's kind of similar to what i'm still doing now but those were like my earliest um solo experiments and of course i record a lot for the band first onto cassette then mini disc and then onto a daw um, which was back in the day Cubase 3.5, but that was before it relaunched. So it was the actual Cubase VST 3.5, uh, even before two tape 32 bit or anything. Do you have moments when you feel you are not able to produce? Do you suffer from free of the blank page? Not when making music. Um, I mean, inspiration for me is usually just showing up and working on something uh, because I have very fixed times and. I go into the studio and then I have time to make something. And uh, even for my contract work, uh, commissioned work, I just go and make something. Writing lyrics, that can be hard, especially if I have to write a bunch of them. Sometimes I have to write like, I don't know, six songs in a week. And that can be, that can be hard. Then I need to completely dive into something because the first three songs, the first three lyrics, they can work, but then I'm drained. I need to recharge my creative battery by reading a lot and uh, doing, <laughs> taking long walks in the park and uh, doing all the other things like cleaning up my room and everything so I, ca I can work in an empty space or yeah, procrastinate a bit more. But um, it is mainly a thing now, like writer's blog is not really a thing for me because I just, um, when I... When I see something like that coming where I'm frustrated and can't get any further, I just pivot to something else. So I would suddenly decide, I'm going to work on on these sounds. So I'm just going to work on a few sounds. Or I'm just going to take, I'm just going to explore this instrument and do something with that. And basically stay immersed in the whole creative space all the time. Sometimes it just helps also to go cook. Take a break, cook yourself a nice meal, eat that, sleep, uh, have a coffee, and then go back. So, yeah, so that's how I deal with that. Black Sand. Does your tastes of music have evolved since you started composing? Um, I think the music that attracted me always had 
I don't know. That's a very difficult question right now. I, of course, it probably has evolved because I've been listening to much more and I listen to it differently. And I've also listened less. <laughs> I do tend to like really take my time when I listen to something. And I can't really listen to music in my studio because then it feels like work. So I like to listen on headphones while uh, or I used to love to listen in a, to listen to music in a car while we still had a car, which is pointless in Berlin. Um, or in the living room. I just love to find, I need a different space for listening to music. So it definitely has changed, but I can't analyze how it has changed. Black Sand, what music are you listening to now? Um, good question. Uh, Nathan Moody's latest album, I'm listening to that. And I get sent in quite a lot of music uh, by uh, people that yeah, just send me their music. I try to listen to as much as I can, which is kind of impossible because it's a one or two per, uh, submissions per day of albums. <laughs> this is... I can't fit that in my schedule. Um, Scott Campbell, uh, Message from the Flood, was a beautiful album that I enjoyed. And my Spotify playlist is full of uh, Kenyan music and full of Mbira music right now. And I enjoy that immensely. And I also listen to, always when I want to relax, I listen to dub. I love dub. So that's something I enjoy. And um, yeah, so these are the things I'm on the top of my head. I would have to check my Spotify list words right on there. Um, Lars Jedalund, have you recently or have you ever dealt with creative block? If so, how did you manage it? Yeah, I think I answered that in the question before. It, it doesn't happen when you're... One thing to add, I think writer's block often happens when you are taken out of the flow, when you are for some reason you have to start anew because once you're in uh, it just tends to go on when you're doing it every day every day work on something and you take maybe one or two days off on the weekend or not uh, then you're always in touch always in touch with your creative flow but if you take uh, a longer break because life comes in the way it can be hard to restart especially when you are working with lyrics I think that's um a much less feedback system than music is because when you play music there's sound in the air when you write something pictures appear in the head it's not as physical um last again you being very consistent your music style genre what are your thoughts on combining something different styles in one release ep or lp obviously everything relatively in the same sonic area of course e electronic ambient and something more rhythmic orientated too diverse from each other it's interesting. I sometimes like making eclectic records. There's this one I made called On Endless Beach, which features everything from ambient to breakbeat. And it's a very summery, very varied record. But then there are my more super minimal, super one thought, almost concept albums, which are usually recorded in a tight frame of time and have a certain topic. And I really, as an album, I oftentimes feel these are more powerful because they say one thing from different perspectives. I think if you stick to the narrative that you have and find a good way to sequence and get the songs, to, the tracks together, it can be very enjoyable, especially for the listener. But think about the listener. Oftentimes the listener wants something because it, the listener wants that specific something. And um, if you've got a one, one continuous album that follows that idea it can be very powerful because the listener can truly immerse himself in that world so yeah those are a few thoughts about that robert bartles will you be hanging out before you play at toronto soundfest and what's your name so i can trust you probably unless it's heimbach in which case please confirm that i can't wait to meet you can i i'm always saying hi i'm heimbach so that's my artist name and when someone has an artist name and is putting that out there i think it's best to address them by that artist name so you can just do that it's fine with me and uh, yeah i'll definitely be hanging out before and after but not that long uh, like i'm having i'm doing a talk on the toronto sound festival on the 22nd of november or is it the 23rd it's the saturday uh mm, this week probably when this video comes out 
and um, I'm doing a talk. So I'll be hanging out uh, between the talk and the show that I'm doing. Uh, Piotr Hitori Bozak. Why the destruction tapes and the archaic laboratory equipment, besides holding mag magnificent in your hands? Thank you. Is it like hacking music or is there a deeper, darker story? <laughs> darker story. Um, I don't think there's a darker story. For me, it's exploration. Um, I love to explore sound. And these are ways in which I can explore sound that to me are still pretty new because I didn't grow up with reel to reels. I grew up mostly already using digital, early digital, mini disc, and then DAWs. And uh, I feel I've discovered a whole bunch of stuff already textually in that field. So magnetic tape was something I got in very late. I mean, it's just seven years ago or something. So there's still so much more to see and discover because it just sounds so incredibly interesting. And there is, I feel, especially in the process when you slow down something you've recorded, you discover all these new frequencies and all these new worlds. It's, it's just endless. And that's what I like about it. And the test equipment, I was inspired by Stockhausen. And when they're putting together their studios and trying to build their own synthesizers from, uh, yeah, test equipment, because there were no synthesizers. And now I'm just looking for the sounds that these can produce. And uh, there's, especially in the Hewlett Packard um, telecommunications equipment, there's some stuff that I don't think anybody has ever heard what it actually does. So they looked at it on scopes, but I don't think an engineer ever heard that this thing makes techno, which is <laughs> crazy to me. So there's the beauty of discovery. That's what I'm mainly interested in. Um, blah, blah, blah. Project Null, again. What did you learn or what did you learn over the years you wish knowing when you started your YouTube channel and musical career? I should have done it earlier. I should have done it way earlier. I mean, this is I was I grew up during grunge, so music was very it had to be very real and there was very much the the sense like yeah, you you don't uh don't overpromote, you don't become too pop. So I was very reserved and that was stupid. I mean, I bought my first camera to film myself like in 2011 and I didn't do it. I just made a silly gif of me uh, spinning on a chair. <laughs> it's somewhere on my Tumblr. If I, God, I used Tumblr back in the day. So um, yeah, I should have done it consistently earlier. It would have made everything easier and simpler for me. So yeah, just... Just document what you're doing. Don't think about, I don't think about this as self-promotion or anything. For me, this is documenting what I'm doing and sharing it with people because I love sharing uh, knowledge and ideas and talking about that. How do you deal with deadlines when composing music for theaters and for film? And as Blacks and asks, do you have moments where you're just unable to produce anything? I answered that. Oh, and also I'm still in some bad stories that happens to you when composing for films or during concerts. Um, the last thing, like the stories and stuff, I think that is something I will, <laughs> I will do for something uh, that's going to be coming out soon or might already have come out. <laughs> um, we, you'll hear about that. It's something I'm working on with my friend Walter of Odd Narrative. Um, deadlines. I love deadlines. Deadlines are perfect. Like deadlines always, uh, always are good to have. And if I don't have a deadline, I'm, I'm sometimes not just not gonna do stuff, because um, I like to plan my year really early in advance. And with the theater work that I have to do, I kind of can because I'm booked years in advance. It's good to have deadlines and to run up against them and bash your head against them and just be, ah, let's do it. Only thing like, worst things are like extreme changes at the end. So you'll have to deal with that. But deadlines, if you're well prepared generally, it's a cool thing. So if you're working non-commissioned music, how do you decide which idea to go with? Do you come up with an idea for an EP or album and see how it develops and go into it from the idea or just start making various songs and then think those would fit together into a certain format? 
Justin Patrick Moore asked that. I, right now, I really enjoy just um, making album in one go, like my album Gestures. That was recorded in just a few days. And I had the instruments set up, I had the idea, I had the sense of loss that I want to communicate. So I just did it like that. Or my album on Opal Tapes, Songs for Coco. Um, Stephen wanted, like Stephen Bishop, who runs Opal Tapes, wanted something that was focused on the Coco Qantas as an instrument, so I knew that. And then I made some tracks, sent them to him, and then he picked three of those and said, "Yeah, no beats, just go into that." And I, and that was really dark, dark pieces where I dealt with, uh, yeah, with the darker side of life and loss. And I had to go there because basically that was what he he thought was good about the album. And I agreed. So I went there and got into very dark places while making the music, which was cathartic, but also very, very drawing. Is that the word? Draining. Draining. Yeah. So I like to do that. And for the new albums that I'm doing, I've got two ideas. I'm doing... I've got a very, I got a very good idea what my next albums are, and these are more complex albums, so they require a lot more work, and I'm collaborating with a lot of people right now, and this will be very more, this will be much bigger in scope and sound. They will, yeah, feature a wider, wider range of instruments. They will be more dynamic and go to more extreme ranges, more extreme ranges. It will still have some of that ambient sensibility, but it will go into a much more dramatic world because that's kind of feel where the world is right now. And uh, there is a lot of stuff, especially as a father of two young daughters, I, I feel I need to communicate about the state of the world that I'm, we all are in. Jake, Fitch, what's your biggest form of creative inspiration? When it comes to outlining an album or EP, are there any other creative media, visual arts, sculpture, etc., that inspire your direction? Poetry. I love poetry. And I read poetry all the time. And it's like these hyper-condensed packages of ideas with that go through extreme spaces and just put seeds into me that can grow. So I love reading poetry. And then I love going into nature, which is a bit harder in Berlin. So here's the Flugfeld Tempelhof, which is a bit recharging like that. But I, if I'm somewhere with trees and mountains, I'm probably uh, the most quickly able to draw upon um, new creative energy. And then there is um visual arts light art especially i'm a fan of that people working with light that can be super inspiring and makes me want to think of, of things and yeah these are like main inspiration sources right now and of course sadly as it is or news just the news can be like little tidbits that i pick up or as corny as it sounds, space. Space, actually, just reading about something that happened in space can be very inspiring because it reminds me of the endlessness and the incredibly unlikeliness that we are here. So, yeah. I think I quoted a Monty Python song just now. Um, how about Susan Martin? How about a beginner's guide to the plum butter or your favorite patches or tips for playing it? What do you love most about it? How does it surprise you? I've been like, I've, I think it's a video that I owe, kind of. Mm. But at the same time, I don't want to do it because the plum butter is, it's one of my most favorite instruments. And right now I feel I'm still discovering it and I don't think I could do it justice in a video right now. It's weird in that regard because... I mean, I could do all these things and I do sometimes on the Patreon uh, Patreon uh, highest tier. Sometimes I did some patches, tricks and all that, teaching that and uh, also to like people that come privately to learn a bit. So, but 
I'm kind of kind of protective about the plum butter because I love it so much and I work so much with it that for some reason or other in there's something in me that says no don't do it and also because how does the rolls actually work I mean how am I gonna describe that except for you plug it in here plug it in here and then you're gonna be feeling how it works because there's a lot of that I might still do a plum butter video but I have to find a way to make it fun for me so that's gonna be my challenge for making it um, Susan Martin what is your compositional process like how much do you plan or structure a piece of music in advance for things like key signals chord progressions themes emotional expressions storytelling or is it more a process of following your intuition and improvising whatever comes up in the moment I usually when I start out Either I just start, oh, I'm going to explore something and I just throw stuff up onto different medias, like I use the Coco Quantas to get ideas or I open up an oscillator and what inspires me most and what I realize where the rest of everything comes from very quickly is texture. Like if I find a really interesting texture that just speaks to me, I immediately build everything around that. So um, it can be something from an instrument just an overtone that rings and suddenly I have all the chords basically and all the chords in my head and I just have to like try to put them together and it becomes a very much very much very quickly it becomes a flow state that is composition yet also improvising and I which is yeah it's improvisation is a uh, real-time <laughs> composition and um I plan definitely a narrative. Narrative is something that I absolutely uh, need in my music. So I'm only kind of an ambient musician. If you listen to my tracks, you will realize there are dramatic turning points. And uh, it's not really ambient music in spirit uh, because it's not the same thing repeating the same cell, same all the time it's not like a musical chair or a musical cupboard or something it's not uh, uh, as Eric Satie had intended mm, it has dramatic movements or narrative movements yeah Paul Chabot oh. I hope I pronounced that right, Paul. I feel like I'm stuck in a digital domain. I have everything I could ever want or need audio-wise at my fingertips, which seems to stifle my creativity. Do you have any ideas on how to get a hardware-based workflow in the box? I feel like I could accomplish more if I had just less, but hardware takes up space and money. I think what you should do is record all your own sounds. Just record completely, only don't basically delete all the plugins. Just record your own sounds, manipulate, manipul um, manipul well, manipulate those, and uh, just work with them. I feel that would be the best idea. And it, then you've got something that's very much you. You could also just pick one synthesizer and make a bank of sounds that is just something you designed. But don't use other people's sounds just use the sounds that you absolutely crafted yourself and build your own building blocks basically it's a bit like that guy uh, who does this wonderful youtube channel primitive technology where he's building everything from scratch and if you do that in your music it's just as satisfying as building a hut in the mud it's uh it's really something special just use your own sounds in the door delete 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 all presets delete all samples that you have uh, or just get a very very narrow focus focus on something i have this one sample like you can take something from uh, the recent pack that i did on the one two four a and just take one sound and see how far this will take you can you make a track out of just that and what you can try also is to get at least a bit out of the box is reamping things just 
playing it from the speakers, recording it again, putting it back, messing with that, giving everything some air. I think there's something magical that happens once air is moved between a uh, source and the microphone. So there's some sort of gold dust being captured. So that would be an idea or a few ideas, but delete, build, create. Yes, and that is all the questions for this Patreon Q&A. If uh, you've got questions, as I said, you can just subscribe to the Patreon on any tier and I'll be putting up a thread every month or every two months and then we'll I'll collect the questions and I'll go through them. So thank you all for watching and thanks to all the patrons especially. And I'm going to find a way to throw up all your names once I've learned how to export to Excel. Not having to use Excel is one of the nicest parts of being me because I never went along with spreadsheets. So thank you all for watching and see you in the next one. Bye.